2nd Maccabees 6-7 records in its history that almost 200 years before the arrival of the Jesus character in the first century, the Roman powers were already dead set on forcing the captive Jewish people to participate in the worship of none other than Dionysus, the human-born demigod sent to take away the sins of the flesh and teach the path to eternal life. To the untrained eye, this may seem completely inconsequential as it relates to the development of the Christian faith in the first century. However, upon closer inspection, this might be the earliest proof of Rome's attempt to introduce a new kind of savior to the kingdom of Israel, one that was friendly towards Greco-Roman ideals, namely Jesus Christ. Welcome to my channel. I'm Justin Best with Bust and Jest. And today I'm very excited to share some information with you that I believe may realign your biblical perspective in a very serious way. If you don't know me or my background or why I'm actually doing this, I have to encourage you to please go check out my intro video on the YouTube channel watch page. Also, over the next coming weeks and months, I'll be posting a ton of information testing the validity of both the New Testament and the Old Testament. So if you're interested in those type of topics, then I have to encourage you to make sure you remember to subscribe and click the bell notifica notification icon so you can be uh, notified whenever I post. Today we find ourselves questioning and discussing the central figure of the entire New Testament, and that's Jesus Christ. Personally, I believe that when a full and fair viewing of the facts is accomplished by an open and honest mind, that it can easily be concluded that there is an undeniable connection between the cult of Dionysus and the Roman development of the Christian beliefs about Jesus Christ. After I lay out some of the most important points in this matter, I'll share with you my personal conclusions as well at the end. So just so you know, what I'm going to be doing is reading to you a study that I created over the last few days and bringing forward some of the main points of this study. This study will also be getting published on my website, bustingest.com, when that website is ready uh, in article format as well to make it even more digestible and easy to reference. So jumping right in, from the very beginning, I have to state that there are many strawman arguments on the internet about whether or not Jesus was an archetypal copy of the previously known demigod named Dionysus. In these false arguments, claims about the Jesus and Dionysus connection are made, which are simply not true and easily defeatable to make it appear that the argument is invalid from its inception. For example, writers defending Christianity and a literal Jesus often claim that there are some opposing Christianity who state that Dionysus was born on December 25th. All of my research has indicated that this is not a common opinion at all, nor is this considered one of the very many actual valid comparisons between the two characters that many scholars have indeed pointed out. Nor was Jesus himself even born on December 25th, according to most New Testament scholars. These type of false statements about the Dionysian cult traditions are designed to distract readers from the true comparisons that should not be ignored. If you can be convinced to quickly and easily dismiss the first examples of comparison with these type of false arguments, you'll be unlikely to search the matter out to its end, believing that the claim was destroyed on its face. I advise you not to be so quick to fall for these diabolical debate traps in which those who are desperate to defend their version of reality will intentionally misrepresent what's being presented, removing your ability to make a simple and fair assessment. It's my belief that the facts about this topic and shared in this study repeatedly demonstrate that Jesus Christ, the character, was built around Dionysian traditions dating back to the Greek Bronze Age at least 900 years before Jesus Christ's arrival in Judea. But before I show you clear examples of what I mean, let me provide a very quick terminology and history lesson on the Dionysian cult. Dionysus has gone by a few names over the centuries, such as Bacchus and Liber, and his original character is said to be traced all the way back to Osiris, the Egyptian equivalent of Dionysus. Dionysian cults have also held many names. Orphism is a name given to a set of 5th and 6th century BCE religious beliefs and practices originating in the ancient Greek and Hellenistic world. It is said that these beliefs also come from the Thracians and are associated with literature ascribed to the mythical poet Orpheus, who descended into the Greek underworld and then returned. The Orphics revered Dionysus, 
who also once descended into the underworld and returned. Orphism has been described as a reform of the earlier Dionysian religion, involving the reinterpretation or rereading of the myth of Dionysus and reordering of Hesiod's theogony, based in part of the, on the pre-Socratic philosophy. So the cult of Dionysus, however, predated Orphism with evidence pointing back as far as 1300 BCE. The earliest records of Dionysus worship actually come from Mycenaean Greece, specifically in and around the palace of Nestor and Pylos dated to around 1300 BC. Orphism, which itself dates back to at least the 6th century BCE, 600 years before Jesus, contained tenets of spiritual concepts which would later become deeply rooted in the foundation of the Christian faith. For example, the central focus of Orphism is a myth which describes humanity as having a dual nature, a body inherited from the Titans, and a divine spark or soul inherited from Dionysus. In order to achieve salvation from the titanic material world's existence, one had to be initiated into the Dionysian mysteries and undergo a ritual purification and reliving of the suffering and death of the God. In my opinion, this is similar to the Christian passion plays and the communion rituals, which we're going to discuss a little bit further. Orphix believed that they would, after death, spend eternity alongside Orpheus, Dionysus, and other heroes. These Orphic concepts permeated the entire Greco-Roman cultures of their time, stemming primarily from much older Dionysian cult practices. Here's a quote from Classical Mythology, 8th edition. It says, in this way, the Orphic Bible provided the divine authority for belief in an immortal soul, the necessity for keeping the soul pure, despite the contamination and degradation of the physical body, the concept of a kind of original sin, the transmigration of the soul to an afterlife of reward or punishment, and finally, after various stages of purification, an apotheosis, a union with the divine spirit in the realms of the upper aether. The seeds of everything come from Phanes or Zeus. Out of one, all things come to be, and into one, they are all once again resolved. End quote. Again, that's from Classical Mythology, 8th edition. So, that's a little bit about Dionysus and the Orphix, but the question has to be next, how popular were Dionysian cults? Dionysian cult beliefs were extremely popular. Some scholars even contend that Dionysian beliefs were the most well-established rivals to the Christian teachings in the early 1st and 2nd century. Festivals of Dionysus included the performance of sacred dramas enacting his myths, which were the initial driving force behind the development of theater in the entire Western culture. The stories of Dionysus were so influential in the development of theater they even named many theaters after him. Actually, a very important piece of evidence for this study is a play written by Euripides called The Bacchae, which was first performed at the Theater of Dionysus in 405 BCE. More on that to come in a few minutes. In fact, by the time the Second Maccabees was written, around 120 to 150 BC, the Romans who held the Jewish kingdom captive were so enthralled with Dionysian beliefs that they were forcing the Jewish people to participate in their festivals. Second Maccabees 6.6 6 says, quote, Moreover, at the monthly celebration of the king's birthday, the Jews, from bitter necessity, had to partake of the sacrifices, and when the festival of Dionysus was celebrated, they were compelled to march in his procession wearing wreaths of ivy. So the question of how prevalent Dionysian cult beliefs were in the earlier Greco-Roman world is answered simply by Very. In his book, Dionysos, Gods and Heroes of the Ancient World, Richard Seaford writes, When Christianity was establishing itself in the ancient Mediterranean world, the cult of Dionysus was its most geographically widespread and deeply rooted rival. And so the Christian church while enclosing the revolutionary ethics of its Gospels within the necessity of social control, was influenced by Dionysiac cult as well as opposing it. In other words, 
Dionysus and Dionysian cults were extremely well known and would have been especially known by the Greek influenced Hellenistic Jews of the first century, who likely read various works on the deity, saw the grand festivities through the year, and perhaps viewed a glimpse of one of the many Orphic plays that were so common in that time and region. Let's talk a little bit about the Hellenization of Judea. Of course, a quick study of Hellenization or Hellenistic Judaism should help you understand that Hellenization was the influence of local regions, including the regions of Judea, in the practices, beliefs, works, music, and philosophical rhetoric of the Greek and Roman world. In other words, Hellenized Jews were those who had one foot in Greece and the other in Jerusalem. The New Testament's Paul, if he were to be considered a literal character, would be a perfect example of a Hellenized Jewish writer who brought nearly all of his theology directly from Greco-Roman and Stoic concepts. Truly, most of Paul's New Testament doctrines can be traced back to the earlier Greek concepts of Plato, Socrates, and Aristotle, and were by no means new or novel ideas. In an upcoming study titled Plato or Paul, I'll outline 20 clear proofs that Paul's character directly plagiarized these earlier Greek writers word for word. But I don't want to get off track here since this study is about the comparisons between the first century Jesus and the earlier Dionysus. Now that a bit of context has been provided, let's jump straight into several clear examples of how the character of Jesus was directly inspired by the demigold cult of Dionysus. First, we'll talk about dying and rising gods. Like others before him, Dionysus was one of the dying and rising gods that were worshipped in antiquity. In fact, it has been argued for decades that this myth spans as far back as 4000 BCE. The oldest known example of the dying and rising god myth is the Sumerian legend of Inanna and her descent to the underworld. In this myth, the Sumerian goddess Inanna travels to the underworld to see her sister. While there, she is killed and hung from a hook on the wall. For three days and three nights, Inanna is dead until she is resurrected with the help of her father, Anki, who was one of the three most powerful gods, by the way. Anki sends two gala, which are gender-neutral ministers, sort of like angels, designed to bring her back. The gala serves Inanna food and water and brings her back to life. I hope I don't have to point out the clear similarities to the stories of the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ here, who was also hung on a cross, was dead for three days and three nights, then was resurrected with the help of his father, who sent two angels to minister to him to guard the tomb as well. The major point here, however, is simply the theme concept. This theme is debated as being a recurring motif throughout the span of history, but one thing can be known for sure. The legends of Dionysus certainly show a half-man, half-god who was killed, brought back from the dead, and resides in the hearts of his followers. If that was the only comparison Dionysus had to Jesus, I could see how some would dismiss this as inconsequential. However, it gets a bit more concerning the more you look. Actually, by the time you're done here, you might wonder if there was very much original about Jesus' character at all. Dionysus' birth and the wine legends. You see, Dionysus was also born of a human woman named Semele, while also being the son of the Most High God, Zeus. In fact, while Dionysus was in the womb of his mother Semele, Zeus was tricked into revealing his true form to her, which caused her to be burned up and destroyed by his fiery appearance, which reminds me of Exodus 33:20, by the way. According to the myth, Zeus was able to save the baby in the womb by sewing Dionysus into his own thigh until his birth. Because of this, Dionysus was granted immortality. According to many legends, Dionysus was considered to be a god disguised as a man, and he was also well known as the god who reveals himself to mankind. Remember, this was far, far before the first century when Jesus supposedly arrived on the scene. Further, those who became initiates of the Dionysian mysteries are said to have been embodied and empowered by the spirit of Dionysus, which grants them additional insights and spiritual strengths. Did I mention that 
Dionysus was also considered the intercessor between the gods and mankind. These are just a few of the theological concepts that clearly mirror the doctrines surrounding Jesus Christ. But let's get even more into the specifics. You see, Dionysus was primarily considered the god of wine for many reasons. In fact, according to Dionysian customs and rituals, it was at the festival of ancient Elis that priests who honored Dionysus would lock three large pitchers inside the temple and to fix coverings over them to ensure they would not be tampered with. Then, according to ancient tradition, the priests would later open the temple doors, remove the seals, and find the pitchers were full of wine. It was considered a miracle of Dionysus. Although no direct story of Dionysus shows he himself turning water into wine, it sure sounds like the first miracle of Jesus in the Gospel of John was written to show readers who were familiar with the Dionysian practices, that this new Jesus character possessed a familiar position of power and deity to that of Dionysus. In fact, Dionysus was said to be the inventor and even the discoverer of wine, the god of the grape harvest. He was the god of winemaking, the god of orchards, and the god of fruit as well. In the Bacchae, written in 410 to 405 BC, Dionysus is called he who makes the clustering vine to grow from man. Later, John 5.15 would quote Jesus as saying, I am the vine, you are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. At the core, both of these teachings hold an eerily similar concept. Somewhere between 580 and 570 BCE, it was written that Dionysus, the god of wine, brought wine to the famous wedding of Peleus and Thetis. Is it any coincidence then that Jesus would arrive on the scene almost 600 years later, turning water to wine for his first miracle at the wedding of Cana? Is it also coincidental and surprising that Jesus was mocked for, quote, revelry, eating, and drinking by his religious counterparts as well? It seems the more you look at Dionysus, the more you see the pre-built character of Jesus Christ, who later called himself the true vine, perhaps as a nod to Dionysus. Not only was being born again and being brought back from the dead a well-known motif of the ancient Dionysus, who was killed by his enemies just to be brought back to life and born again by his grandmother, but these were also concepts echoed by the first and second century Jesus figure who also was said to be killed by his enemies, descend into the underworld, and then be brought back to life as well. Additionally, the stories surrounding the capture of Dionysus and the capture of Jesus are eerily similar in ways that I believe cannot be ignored. This is the arrest and trial of Dionysus. For example, despite his divinity, Dionysus lived among humans, not as a god, but in disguise as a man just like Jesus, and was somehow closer to humanity than any other deity. Stories of his life on earth, notably the Bacchae by Euripides, make it clear that Dionysus' true power was only recognized by his closest and truest followers. In an important event from this book, again written around 410 BCE, Dionysus freely allows himself to be captured and persecuted before finally revealing himself in true glory. The Bacchae's description of Dionysus submitting to his captors is eerily similar to the same events in the Christian tradition. Reading the text, when the guard delivers Dionysus as a captive to Pentheus, he says, quote, Pentheus, here we are, having hunted the quarry you sent us after, and our efforts have not been unsuccessful, but we found this wild beast tame, talking about Dionysus. He did not attempt to flee but gave me his hands willingly. He did not even turn pale, but kept the flush of wine in his cheeks. With a smile, he bade me tie him up and led him away and waited for me, thus making my task easy. I was taken aback and said, O oh stranger, I do not arrest you of my own free will, but at the orders of Pentheus who sent me. I also want to quickly note here that Jesus' arrest would have also occurred directly following his wine drinking with his disciples at the Last Supper event as well. 
meaning it could be concluded that he would have also had wine in his blood when he was arrested. Similarly, Dionysus here is said to still have his cheeks flush with wine as well. But the bigger point is more importantly that Dionysus, the half man, half God with powerful options, gives himself over to his captors willingly and without a fight, just like the story of Jesus. Immediately following, Dionysus goes through a trial of sorts, where he refuses to answer Pentheus' questions directly, and instead antagonizes the ruler and is thus put into prison. Later that night, a great earthquake shakes the prison that held Dionysus, causing all the chains to fall off of the prisoner and setting him free. Then Pentheus rushes in with his sword unsheathed, looking for Dionysus, who is found to have calmly remained behind. Pentheus falls to the floor in despair, and thus Dionysus converts Pentheus into one of his followers. Similarly, Acts 16.25-35 mentions an account that could have only been inspired by the Dionysian story in Euripides. While Paul and Silas are imprisoned during their ministry, it's about midnight when a great earthquake shakes the prison doors open and shakes the chains loose from the prisoners, Paul and Silas. The prison guard also draws his sword, but in this story it's to harm himself. Paul calmly assures the prison guard that they are still there. The prison guard falls to Paul and Silas' feet as well, and thus Paul converts him to the faith of Jesus Christ. To myself and many others, these coincidences are too frequent to be discounted, and the list of the traditional similarities between Dionysian cult motifs and the themes of Jesus Christ is way too long to be ignored. Far more damning examples of Paul's New Testament writings clearly copying the Bacchae by Euripides, word for word, will be demonstrated in another video. But let's just say that Paul wasn't the first person to kick against the pricks while being corrected by a demigod for his persecution of his followers. The Eucharist of Dionysus. Another such example is a practice of eating the body and drinking the blood of Dionysus in a sort of communion Eucharist ritual that was occurring far before the first century. In one version of the text, Dionysus changes his form multiple times to avoid being found and killed by the Titans, finally changing himself into a bull. Being finally caught, it was written that he was cut into pieces by the murderous knives of his enemies. Additionally, we find that the ancient followers of Dionysus would practice the ritual of dividing up a bull and eating its raw flesh and drinking wine in thanksgiving and in remembrance of their God. And it is argued that they believed they were eating the body and blood of their Savior in order to reach a spiritual communion with Dionysus. In his 1890 published book called The Golden Bow, by Scottish anthropologist Sir James George Fraser, he writes, quote, When we consider the practice of portraying the god as a bull or with some of the features of the animal, the belief that he appeared in bull form to his worshippers at the sacred rites, and the legend that in bull form he had been torn to pieces, we cannot doubt that in rending and devouring a live bull at the festival, the worshippers of Dionysus believed themselves to be killing the god eating his flesh, and drinking his blood. For those of you familiar with the implements of Christian tradition, you'll know that Jesus Christ would offer a very similar type of ceremony during his Last Supper. During this meal, Jesus would clearly state that the bread that he was offering represented his very own body, which would be broken, and the wine represented his very own blood. In Luke twenty-two nineteen through 20 Jesus says, and when he had taken some bread and given thanks, he broke it and gave it to them, saying, This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way, he took the cup after they had eaten, saying, This cup is poured out for you, is the new covenant in my blood. Additionally, in 1 Corinthians eleven twenty six, Jesus states plainly that, For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, ye do show the Lord's death until he comes. So simply, this form of communion or Eucharist it, that seems to be first implemented by Jesus Christ before his death was actually a previously established rite of the mystery religions who were conducting the practice 
in remembrance of Dionysus' death at the hands of the Titans. Again, Jesus seems to either be competing with Dionysian practices that came long before the first century, or the writers of Jesus' story were merely copying them to make Jesus more palatable and a more familiar savior. In fact, it could be argued that many of the motifs of Dionysian beliefs can be found scattered through the entire New Testament, such as the concept of overcoming the sinful flesh to embrace the spiritual elements of Dionysus. Clearly, the overall worship and practice of Dionysian cult mysteries was far different than the Christian custom and practices surrounding Jesus Christ to this day. This comparative analysis in no way implies that the outcome of each religious endeavor is the same by any means. This is merely evidence that many of the New Testament books were not written solely by the inspiration of God alone based on true events that literally took place in first century history. Instead, historic research demonstrates that the messianic character of Jesus Christ was developed over time as an archetypal hero figure with many political and social agendas in mind. I believe that some of the reasons for this amalgamation of messiahs was to, one, cause the worship of Dionysus and promote Roman thinking, as we saw in 2 Maccabees in the very beginning of the video, two, to integrate Hebrew culture with Greek culture, which is also con called the Hellenization of the Jewish people, which I've talked about extensively and we'll talk about more on this channel, and three, to provide explanations for the destruction of the Jewish temple and the Jewish religion. And the reason, of course, was for not obeying Jesus, which is a motif already identified also with Dionysus and other, uh, other themes as well. So if you'd like some insight into the bigger picture that I am seeing developed here, I recommend that you read Creating Christ by James Valiant and Warren Fahey, as well as view The Caesar's Messiah by Joseph Atwell on YouTube. I believe once all the data is taken into account, a very real hypothesis arises that Jesus Christ's total character was intentionally developed as a Jewish Messiah in a mostly failed attempt to convince the Jewish people to cease their rebellious attempts to oust Rome and finally join the Greco-Roman traditions. Jesus was designed to reconcile two worlds, an attempt to make Greek doctrines palatable to the Hebrew people. In closing, I'd like to summarize by saying that Dionysus and the Orphic traditions beat Jesus and the New Testament to the punch in far too many areas to cover in just one study. But you can be sure that this study isn't the only proof of this blending of cultures and religions through time. In another study coming very soon, I'll demonstrate very clear contextual evidence that the Gospel of Mark directly copied from Homer in a methodical and repetitive way that could only be possible by intentional mimicry. I hope this study gives you some additional insight into my perspectives on the Bible and help to answer questions you may have had about the connections between Dionysus and Jesus. Again, if you enjoy the content and you want to hear more about the things that I'm sharing with you, make sure you don't forget to subscribe and click the bell notification so you'll be notified when I post in the future. I'm very excited to share with you more of my future studies coming very soon. Again, I'm Justin Best with Bust and Jest. Until next time, stay logical, stay rational, and stay away from mind control. Peace.